is it fine is it visible dr sahu yeah yeah it's visible ha okay. ha uh-huh, it's visible you can please okay. carry on <clears throat> good morning to all um my session is all about the design of magnetic components for power electronics but this will be a very primitive or introductory section we will not go much details of the so, magnetic design hello uh, sorry to sir sorry to interrupt uh, can you please uh, uh, go on full screen mode now so already in full screen that's what i'm feeling aha uh-huh. full screen okay yeah. okay okay please okay. carry on ha ah, okay. please carry on ha ah. okay uh, this will be an introductory uh, section uh, a prim- prim- pr- primary knowledge about magnetic design and how to design a power uh, high frequency inductor or a transformer that will be dealt here um i will not go much deep it will be an introductory section so before going to the ma- uh, design for magnetic material we will see what are the commonly available magnetic materials for power electronics converters and as you know when it comes to the power converters we have a basically three magnetic materials which we usually use one is we need to build an inductors inductors may be used for storing the energy or sometime you may have to build an inductor as a filter element or sometime to suppress the emis in another magnetic component is the transformers we may have to build transformers high frequency transformers then sometime we may have to build a current sensors by using a ct current transformers so these are the three primary magnetic components available in any power converters either an inductor or a transformer or a uh, what you can say a current transformer to uh, measure the current so nowadays the current transformers are replaced by uh, more efficient uh, hall effect sensors but still it is costly so we will have some introduction we know that the magnetic materials in general can be classified into three groups uh, one is paramagnetic material diamagnetic material and ferromagnetic materials when it comes to the diamagnetic materials the permeability is very less less than 1 whereas paramagnetic material have a slightly larger than 1 permeability and the ferromagnetic materials are something which have a permeability ranges from uh, 10 to 1 lakh so the relative permeability of ferromagnetic material is quite large so among the magnetic materials we if you plotted the bh curve you could see uh, with respect to the free free space the relative permeability of all these two magnetic materials are quite poor and if you wanted to generate a certain flux for example if you wanted to generate certain flux you may have to apply a large amount of current whereas if you see the ferromagnetic material if you wanted to generate a large flux in the core you required a substantially smaller current because its relative permeability is very large so for our power or or magnetic application we generally go for the ferromagnetic materials among the ferromagnetic materials there are different kind of materials available we will see one by one but if you see the characteristics the bh curve of a ferromagnetic materials you could see they actually exhibit a kind of a saturation so a practical ferromagnetic material um, if you apply a large magnetizing force finally it's end up saturation so that is something which is an undesirable characteristics but it is in unavoidable it will be uh, it will be uh, a part of our material or it is an inherent characteristics of a material that cannot be avoided but as a designer we will try to avoid to operate our inductors or transformers in the saturation area so apart from the saturation area you could see we have a linear region and our all of our inductors or transformers we try to operate in this linear region of operation so when it comes to the ferromagnetic materials uh, they can be classified into two 
one is known to be the hard magnetic material and another is a soft magnetic materials so hard not in the sense of the material hardness hard here means these materials are quite hard to magnetize it is difficult to magnetize once you magnetize it is difficult to demagnetize that is why it is known to be the hard magnetic material difficult to magnetize and once it magnetizes it is difficult to demagnetize so such materials we usually use for making electrical machines for for example a permanent magnet uh, to build a permanent magnet for electrical machines we usually go for a hard magnetics material they used to have a large bh curve and the bh loop will be quite large the area is quite large so you will have to apply a substantial uh, uh, force to magnetize and a substantial force to demagnetize whereas the soft magnetic materials in contradiction uh, they can be magnetized and demagnetized very fast or you don't require much energy to spend to magnetize and demagnetize so that is why they are known to be the soft magnetic materials so in our power of electronics application we may be switching our converters in quite fast so the magnetic component associated with the converters need to be magnetized and demagnetized or it it experience this uh, change in flux in a very faster rate so for all power electronics application we may use the soft magnetic materials for building inductors transformers etc so one of the since it is easy to magnetize and demagnetize they will have a very small hysteresis loop very small hysteresis loop very small so it is quite easy to demagnetize and magnetize and they are used in a power electronic applications one of the commonly used material for building a high frequency transformer or an inductor in a power electronics is a ferrite ferrite is one of the most commonly used material and ferrite is not the only available material for a power uh, to build a high frequency inductor or a transformer we can have a, a different magnetic core for example powdered iron core are there we have amorphous core and now in day we have a nano crystalline material cores so we will try to see uh, the characteristics of these materials first then later we will try to design an inductor and what are the uh, steps which involved to design an inductor and how you can realize a high frequency inductor in a real world so we will first see the commonly available or widely used magnetic material that is a ferrite so when you see the ferrite core ferrite core is basically iron oxide iron oxide plus a manganese or nickel or zinc oxide together so iron oxide powder plus a manganese oxide or nickel oxide they will be mixed together and then will be precasted in a different shape so that is why ferrite cores are available in a different shapes uh, you may be very familiar with this ferrite core that is a known to be the e core so two e core make a, a one complete set of a magnet i mean complete set uh, because it is casted like an e core Uh, just like a precasted or precasted modules the ferrite cores are precasted modules uh, once it is casted it is uh, it is quite brittle also you cannot uh, alter its shape and since it's brittle if you use some kind of a force there is a high chance it may break once it is broken it cannot be repaired so once dealing with the ferrite core you should be extremely careful don't apply much mechanical forces such a way that it got a damage once damaged uh, there is no other solution just throw away the core you cannot uh, uh, glue it by using some kind of a glue even if you glue it its magnetic property will be reduced because of the large air gap which is caused by uh, gluing the uh, broken part so commonly available for eight core is in the e shape so two e core form a complete magnetic setup or magnetic path so another core is an etd core or uh, etd core you can see this is very sim similar to the e core but if you see the middle limb instead of a square we have a cylindrical structure at the middle and uh, remaining two limbs you can have a curvature shape 
curvature shape just like a pole shoe of a dc machines uh, the dc machines magnet have also have a curvature structure so that compared to the etd core e w core this core will have a more magnetic linkage more flex linkage so etd core usually have a smaller leakage compared to the w core then you may have a very commonly available toroidal shape toroidal shape of core you could say the toroidal shapes of core are basically used to build uh, emi filters emi filters in power converters uh, we will see about the toroidal core later and sometime there is a c core or u core these are known to be the c bar u core and you could see the cores are available in different size also there are double a core larger size the same double a core can be available in a smaller size as well and there are ferrite beds are available these are ferrite beds available you can see this is a ferrite bed uh, with a hollow inside right in the hole inside this uh, inside this hole you could pass a wire usually for emi suppression uh, we use this kind of a ferrite beds Uh, for example if you see your laptops if you see your laptops chargers or even mo uh, mobile phone chargers in general uh, you could see uh, for example you may be not down that uh, let us say is your uh, laptop charger and you may not down there will the wires which is going to the chargers may have a small hump uh, and that will be go to the your plug plug point so the chargers may have a small hub similarly uh, even a long wires for your pre, uh, projectors also you can see a uh, ferrite bed attached so this basically act as an emi uh, suppression element because when this uh, uh, emis are of large frequency when a high frequency component pass through this ferrite bed the ferrite bed have a re reactance or what is can say impedance or re reactance which is proportional to the frequency so as the frequency increases the re react this ferrite bed increases so the ferrite bed provide a high frequency or high reactance or high resistance uh, to the emi components so the, such emi components will not be uh, propagated back to the system so as an emi suppression you could use this kind of a ferrite beds so this is how different uh, ferrite components are used um one of the things which uh, we need to see while dealing with the ferrite bed i mean ferrite core uh, one is its saturation flux density so if you see the magnetic characteristics of a ferrite core for example if you consider the bh curve as i said there is a linear portion initially and then finally it is getting to the saturation so the maximum flux density that uh, you can apply or you can you can have without saturation is known to be the b sat the saturation flux density so for a ferrite core a typical saturation flux density is in the range of a 0.4 tesla to 0.45 tesla uh, or you could say it's a 4000 goes to 4500 goes uh, goes or tesla these are the two uh, unit which is used to represent the flux density so the flux density of a ferrite core is uh, very small or saturation flux density is quite small in the range of a 0.4 to 0.45 tesla and remember this flux density is measured at a temperature of 25 degrees celsius 25 degrees celsius so as the temperature increases for example if temperature is 50 degrees celsius uh, this saturation flux density go down so while designing your inductor you should be remember that uh, uh, the converters or power electronics converters will not be operating at 25 degrees celsius when the converter is operating the temperature of the system will be in the range of a 60 degree to 80 degree or even reach up to 100 degrees celsius if proper cooling arrangement is not provided so in general the temperature will be to 60 to 80 degrees celsius so in that case the flux density which 
maximum flux density, which is given in the data sheet, is basically measured at 25 degrees Celsius. But at 60 degree to 80 degrees Celsius of temperature, the flux density rapidly reduces. So as the flux density rapidly reduces, what will happen? The inductance which you designed. For example, if you design an inductor for a 100 micro Henry, considering the flux density of 0.45 Tesla, but in actual practice, because of the temperature rise, the inductance may go to 50 micro Henry or less than that. So we should we should take a care uh, to take a appropriate value of the flux density while designing the inductor in order to accommodate in order to accommodate the change in temperature. So as I told, this Farad score are uh, basically iron oxide with a uh, manganese or zinc or silicon. Uh, oxides and it's a mixture and then precasted into a different shape. Uh, they have a smaller saturation flux density, but one of the advantage of this ferrate core is that they have a high resistivity, so the eddy current losses are eddy current is very minimum, and also the BH curve, I mean hysteresis losses also very minimum. So it have a very small BH curve or BH uh, hysteresis area, so core losses are very minimum for this ferrate core. That is why uh, we could use for a high frequency applications. For a typical for eight core can be used up to megahertz of frequency range, a megahertz of frequency range. Whereas if you see a 50 hertz or 60 hertz transformer score, which are silicon samples, uh, they can be uh, operate uh, maybe a 400 hertz to one kilohertz of frequency at max. At maximum, you can operate up to one kilohertz of frequency. If you try to operate be above one kilohertz of frequency. More of the more, most of this low frequency core uh, basically experiences excessive heating uh, due to the increase in core losses uh, because of the BH curve is quite uh, wide. So it experiences uh, uh, excessive heating because of the core losses. So that is why the ordinary uh, transformer core cannot be used at high frequencies. Whereas the ferrite core, since it having a very small uh, flex, I mean VH curve, and having a very uh, uh, what you can say very core, very less core losses, we could operate even up to the megahertz of range. Another uh, thing which is need to be considered while designing the inductor is the Curie temperature. As you know, the Curie temperature is the temperature at which a ferromagnetic material lose its magnetic property and become a paramagnetic or diamagnetic. So basically, if you operate near to the Curie temperature, a ferromagnetic material become a non-magnetic material. Its magnetism is lost. So most of the ferrite core, the Curie temperature is around 200 degrees Celsius. So even that means we, we should not operate in a high temperature because its magnetic property may go down. So when it comes to the high frequency ferrite core, you can see the manganese and zinc ferrite core can be used uh, up to one megahertz of frequency. And if you want more than one megahertz of frequency range, nickel zinc ferrite cores are commonly used. So most of our power electronics applications, uh, we may uh, go with a manganese zinc ferrite core, which is widely available in our local market which can operate up to one kilohertz, one megahertz of frequency. Whereas once you need a gallium nitrate based power converters, where your uh, frequency of operation is usually more than one megahertz of frequency, maybe one, two or three megahertz. In that case, we may have to go for a nickel zinc for eight core, which can have a very high electrical resistivity. So very small deep current losses and uh, it can operate with uh, eff efficiently over a one megahertz of frequency range. So, if you see the some of the ferrite core data sheets, we will get more information from the data sheet uh, that you can see here. For example, if you consider one one of the ferrite core, which is made up of a manganese zinc and N87 grade. Usually this ferrite score are available in different grade, N87, N27, something like that. So different grade having different magnetic properties and material properties. So there will be few 
important details or data are given usually in the data sheets. This data sheets of a from a TDK, TDK or a course. This there's a committee makes a very good Farid core, uh, very high quality for Farid core. Another company which make similar core is a Feroz Cube. There are Indian, there are some of Indian companies also. For example, Hyderabad based Cosmos is an Indian company which also make a uh, very good Farid core, in, which is also available in our local market. So let us uh, take a, a standard Farid core made up of a, made up of an N87 material and examine some of the parameters. So if you see uh, one of the parameters which is mentioned in the data set, sheet is the initial permeability mu i. So what do you mean by the initial permeability? So if you see the BH curve of a Farad core, as I told, initially there is a linear region and slowly goes to the saturation. So the permeability in this region, the relative permeability in this region is the initial permeability mu i. And in fact, the permeability changes as you move upon the curve because of its non-linear characteristics. If our BH curve is a straight line, if our BH curve is a linear, then the permeability is almost everywhere will be constant. The slope will be constant, but since it's a non-linear, uh, when it comes to the, when it go to the high flux region, the non-linearity increases. So this region, the permeability changes rapidly. So what the uh, data sheet or the The manufacturer, what they will uh, do, they will initially give you the initial value of the permeability that also measured at 25 degrees Celsius. At 25 degrees Celsius, you could see that is the value of 2200. So in general, for a Farad core, which is used for a power electronics application, in power electronics application, the permeability or relative permeability of a Farad core is in the range of 1000 to 3000. 1000 to 3000 that is the usual range of a permeability of a Farad core which is used for switched mode power converters smpc but if you are using for a emi filters or any other applications there are Farad scores available whose permeability ranges more than 10000 more than 10000 or very near to the 1 lakh but uh, most of our uh, power electronics based for i mean for eight core for power electronics application, the permeability or initial permeability of the core is restricted or available in the range of a thousand to three thousand. That is what you can see here. Uh, this material having an initial permeability of two thousand two hundred. Uh, that is uh, actually this permeability. As you climb up, uh, due to the nonlinear characteristics of the curve, the permeability changes. Another thing you could see the flux density also. This flux density is the maximum flux density. If you apply any force more than this, uh, your core will get saturated. So you could see uh, at 25 degrees Celsius, this particular grade of the Farad core exhibit a flux density of 490 millitesla, or you can say 0.4 tesla. So at 0.4 tesla is the saturation flux density for this particular Farad core which is measured at 25 degrees Celsius, measured at 25 degrees Celsius. But the same data sheet, you could have another important aspect. If you up, uh, apply 100 degrees Celsius, then the flux density reduced to 390 millitesla or 0.3. So from a 0.49 or similar to 0.5 to 0.4 or 0.39, there is a reduction in the flux density uh, when the temperature increases. That is something we need to take into the account. So as the temperature increases, the flux density rapidly reduces. So as a safer re, uh, point of thumb, what you can say as a design thumb, what we will do as a uh, thumb of rule, uh, as the temperature increases, I, I can say the flux density, for example, this flux density is around 0.49 Tesla. That is around 20 or 25 degrees Celsius of temperature. Let us say this is 0.45 Tesla. And our operating temperature may be around 80 to 100. Our power converters may be operating somewhere here. So the flux density at this temperature will be 
for for example, if the point two eight Tesla, two eight Tesla. So while designing the inductors or transformer, what we will do, instead of taking the maximum flux density, which is measured in a smaller temperature, we will go to take we will take this range of flux density for a safer operating region. So as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, when you have a Faraday core, we usually fix the maximum flux density at 0.2 Tesla to 0.3 Tesla, even though the maximum flux density can go up to 0.49 because we have to consider the temperature. So this is one of the rule of thumb which you, we usually make use uh, to have a stable uh, flux density, to have a stable flux density over a operating temperature. We restrict our design by taking the maximum flux density around 2000 goes or 3000 goes or 0.2 to 0.3 Teslas. That is uh, also evident from our uh, data sheet. Uh, as the temperature increases, the flux density reduces. And also you could see uh, uh, other important parameters. That is, what is the core loss? Core loss. So usually core loss will be uh, given by the uh, manufacturer, uh, how much uh, wattage per cubic centimeter or kilowatt per meter cube? Uh, how much the, what is the core loss per uh, cubic centimeter or cubic meter? So that is what represented here. You could see if you're operating a Faraday core at a 0.2 Tesla at a 100 degrees Celsius, and if you apply a repetitive flux swing of 25 kilohertz, then you can expect a 57 kilowatt per meter cube of core loss. This loss include both a decurrent and a uh, hysteresis losses. So you may, you may feel what you mean by this 25 kilohertz and what you mean by 200 MT. Uh, let us see uh, these two terms then we will have a better understanding. Uh, I, I understand you may be knowing a boost converter or a buck converter. Let us consider a boost converter for as our example. A boost converter having an input inductor. And Assume this converter is working at a continuous conduction mode and there is an inductor current IL of T flowing through this converter. Assume this converter is working in a continuous conduction mode. So in this time, if you try to see the current at steady state, this current looks like something like this. This is a repetitively increasing and decreasing with a triangular shape. That is will be the uh, a normal shape of a current through this boost inductor. So this is a normal shape of the current at a continuous conduction mode for a boost inductor. So if you this, this see this current, this current have a two component. One is a continuously repeating component and another is a, an average value, uh, having an average value. So let me put this an average value IL. In fact, for a boost converter, this average value of this inductor current is same as this input current I in, the in average value of the input current, both are same. If it is a buck converter, this inductor will be in the output side. So average value of the in inductor current of the buck converter will be same as your output current. So now, if you, ex if you examine this particular inductor current, you could see there is an AC component plus a DC component an AC component and a DC component. This is the DC component of the inductor current. This is a component of the inductor current. Basically, this is the average value IL. And this is the AC component of the inductor current. AC component of the inductor current. And we call it as a ripple current, delta IL. So we have an AC component and a DC component. So what is the importance of the DC component? Or we call this DC component as a DC bias current. We call this DC component as a DC bias current. 
and this current this dc component have a very uh, i mean having a crucial uh, role while designing our inductor uh, because when it comes to the power electronics converters most of the converters uh, the inductors experience or the inductors have to handle a dc component of the current so we should design this inductor such a way that the uh, the magnetic core or inductor can operate with this dc component without getting saturated so uh, we should see what is the significance of this dc component as i told the bh curve if you see the bh curve let us say we were operating somewhere here this is the average value of our inductor current let us say uh, due to this much inductor current il i am producing some flux and this flux density is somewhere here so this is corresponding to the il proportional to the il so i am operating the somewhere here this is what happening now top of this dc current i having a repeating component or repetitive component that is an ac component you could see this ac component is increasing for some time then decreasing and go below this uh, average value then again increasing and then decreasing below the average value at steady state uh, this por this portion delta il by and this portion will be same at steady state the positive half cycle and negative half cycle will be same so i could say this portion is delta il by 2 and this portion is delta il by 2 that means with respect to this bias value the dc bias value which is corresponding to capital il we we will have a superimposed ac component which corresponding to delta il by 2 so what does it mean with respect to this point during the positive half cycle or positive swing of your inductor current my flux density rise to this flux density goes in this direction when my inductor current goes up goes up similarly when my inductor current goes down with respect to the dc bias point my flux density goes down my flux density goes down that means this flux density or i could say there is a swing of flux the flux is swinging the flux is swinging between two points the flux is getting swing between these two point we call it as a delta b delta b so the core loss and even eddy current losses eddy current and hysteresis losses for a ferrite core not on, not depends upon b not but it's basically depends upon the delta b so i could say the core loss or eddy current loss so i mean core loss that means both eddy current eddy plus hysteresis losses depends on the repetitive fluxing depends on delta b the repetitive fluxing and basically not depends upon the b not it's not depends upon the b not so how much this flux swing is happening that determine the core loss how much this flux swing is happening that determines the core loss uh, in fact that is what given here when you say 200 ml tesla 200 ml tesla means 0.2 tesla 0.2 tesla means your flux swing is happening um i have a small issue here okay okay uh is it visible yes yes you carry on okay okay so this a so point this to point to tesla means this swing this is the point to tesla not this one that means a 100 milli tesla swing in the positive direction 100 milli tesla in the negative direction so 
if your ferrite core is experiencing a 200 milli tesla swing at a 25 kilohertz then a total core loss of a 57 milliwatt per cubic meter uh, cubic centimeter will be existing or will be lost but if you see the frequency increases the same condition but if you the same flux swing of 200 milli tesla but the moment you increase the frequency as expected the eddy current losses and uh, hysteresis losses are the functions of the frequency they increases by some factor similar later uh, as the frequency increases further uh, the the losses increases further but you can see this is not a linear increase and also it is not a uh, square term it is a non linear increase so what usually manufacturer will do they will give a I mean, data sheet where you could find out how the losses has been changes with frequency and the flex swing for example there is a 100 milli tesla flex swing is happening and uh, what will be the losses at 25 degrees celsius and 100 degrees celsius this dot dotted line represent the 100 degrees celsius and this uh, rigid line represent the 25 degrees celsius for example if you have a 100 milli tesla flex swing once you apply it and if you operate at the 100 degrees celsius you could find out uh, the corresponding losses that is about uh, uh, this particular point so you could find out from this graph what is expected uh, core loss that include both eddy current losses and flux density and if you wanted to see the temperature changes as well for example as the temperature changes as i as i told the temperature changes the flux density reduces so the losses also changes so different flux swings at 100 kilohertz you could find out what is the uh, core losses with respect to the ferrite core so this way you could estimate the maximum core loss experienced by your inductor or a transformer if you apply a particular flux swing with a particular frequency and if you know the operating temperature as well and uh, uh, this is what uh, 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 i was discussing uh, usually the manufacturer measure the flux density at a 25 degrees celsius you could see the this is a hysteresis loop so you could see the hysteresis area is very small for a ferrite core around point four five or point four nine tesla this hysteresis loop is getting bent or saturating so i could say uh, the saturation flux density is around point four five or point four nine tesla here but the same condition same test condition of giving a 10 kilohertz of repetitive waveform at 25 degrees celsius but if you increase the temperature i could say the flux saturation is happening much earlier maybe around a 0.39 tesla so that is why we as a rule of thumb we usually take 0.2 to 0.3 tesla as a standard so from another graph you could find out the relative core losses uh, and also how the permeability changes with the temperature that also available in the graphs in the data sheets remember this is for a particular uh, material n87 which is basically made up of a made up of iron core with manganese and zinc oxides there are n27 materials other uh, uh, materials are available for each material the manufacturer will provide a different data sheets so as a designer it is our duty to go and check the data sheet and understand the properties and uh, the required uh, information from the data sheet so let us typically see uh, what are the other cores are available and uh, as i told uh, we can use this particular core nickel sink for a very high frequency but most of the magnetic ferrite core which is available on our local market is made up of a manganese sink there will be an n87 material or n27 materials because uh, our typical operating frequencies lies less than one megahertz unless and until we are going for a gallium nitrate devices
Now, apart from the uh, ferrite core, there are some other magnetic cores which are commonly available to build high frequency inductors and transformer. One among them are a powder core. Powder cores are made up of a iron, iron oxides. Actually, uh, we will be making a very thin powders of iron oxides. And this thin powders of iron oxides will be mixed with the insulation, insulating components. Basically, we will be putting some insulating components along with this uh, iron oxide, and then we will press and pre uh, it undergo the heat treatment, and finally make it as a magnetic core in different shape, uh, W shape, uh, toroidal shape, etc. So you see this powdered cores consisting of a ferrite powder plus an insulating materials. It's a blend of a ferrite and an insulating materials. So you may be wondering why we need an insulating material along with the ferromagnetic material to build a high frequency inductors or transformers. Why we need an insulating material? Whereas the ferrite core, we don't have these insulating materials. So whatever I marked with the green is an insulating materials. Whatever I marked with red, let us assume it is a ferrate powders. So this will be mixed together and precasted. I undergo the heat treatment and precasted into different shape, and we call it as a powder pour. So we should know why this insulation material is uh, uh, provided or why this uh, distributed throughout the powdered core. So let us see. Uh, some of the magnetic properties and how this. Uh, if you see a magnetic core, let us consider a simple magnetic structure, uh, which is uh, very familiar with all of us. Let us have some uh, current is flowing through this and having some turns, n number of turns. So due to this, uh, current flowing through this n number of turns, what you will have? You will have a MMF, which is given by number of turns into the current. Due to this MMF, you will have some flux flowing through the magnetic core, some flux flowing through the magnetic core. And let us say this is a flux F. And we could represent this magnetic circuit by its equivalent electrical circuit by considering MMF as the source, right? MMF as the source and the flux as the current and the current, the flux is flowing through the magnetic core. So the magnetic core offers some reluctance or resistance. We call it as a reluctance in our reluctance of the core. And you will have an equivalent circuit, something like this, through which I am having some flux. So I could write the flux is equal to the MMF divided by the reluctance. reluctance reluctance of the core. In fact, you could see the inductor, you may remember inductance is given by the square of this number of turns divided by the reluctance. Inductance is given by the square of the number of turns divided by the reluctance. And the reluctance of the core is given by what is the, what is the uh, uh, mean magnetic path length, LE. LE divided by the permeability of the core and this area of cross section, this area of cross section. This is what we actually get. So once you substitute here, we can find out the reluctance. I mean, inductance of the inductance or induct the inductance of this particular inductor. So if you consider phi is, or you can say the MMF is given by uh, phi divided times RC, reluctance of the core. And you know this current is proportional to H and the flux is proportional to the flux density. So if I plot phi versus I, if I plot phi versus I, I will get a graph that is equivalent to a BH. I will get a graph which is equivalent to the BH curve. And I'm not considering the hysteresis now. It will be a linear graph where the slope is given by one by reluctance of the core. If there is no saturation, uh, this uh, curve will be a linear curve, but the moment you have a saturation, somewhere here you will hit the saturation 
so we call it as a saturation flux density b sat and the current corresponding to this saturation is let me call it as an i1 so what i can say here if i apply a current i1 the flux produced in the core is equal to the saturation flux density so any current more than i1 completely saturate my core what will happen if the core got saturate once the magnetic core got saturate it act as a short circuit as far as the current is concerned so it will draw a large amount of current from the source so it basically acting as a short circuit in our practical world so it uh, take a large amount of current so we don't operate in the saturation region but here from our simple analysis i could say when the current i1 is applied i will reach the saturation flux density b sat now what i am doing the same magnetic core i am providing a small air gap instead of uh, using the magnetic core alone i will be providing a small air gap lg and the same experiment i am doing i have uh, some current i number of turns n now we have two path as we know the flux is flowing through core as well as flux is going through the air gap i am assuming there is no fringing effect i am assuming there is no fringing all the flux is uniformly passing through the air gap that is what my assumption so in that case i can draw again my equivalent electrical circuit mm of is ni with the core reluctance rc and my air gap reluctance rg air gap reluctance rg so i could say now the mmf is given by the flux times rc plus rg reluctance of the core then if you plot phi versus i that is equivalent to b versus h because i is proportional to h flux is proportional to b once the core shape and area is uh, fixed so in that case what you will see what you can see this curve is now having a slope which is 1 by rc plus 1 by rg 1 by rc plus 1 by rg the slope increases that means instead of hitting the saturation point i1 i may be this curve have a different slope and you may hit the saturation somewhere here you will be hitting the saturation somewhere here because now the your slope is 1 by the reluctance of the core and the reluctance of the air gap now you are hitting the saturation at a current i2 which is larger i1 or i2 obviously the i2 is larger i2 is larger so what does it mean without saturation now your inductor can have a more a more large amount of current whereas once you did not provide an air gap you could have a current of i1 that is a maximum current where you will be hitting the saturation the moment i provide an air gap i i could have a larger current i2 but the saturation flux density remains same let us say it is a 0.3 tesla that remains same but you could have pass a large amount of current so the presence of a air gap will allow us to operate my inductor or am allow to operate the inductors or magnetic core with a high current you could have a, you can pass a high current without getting saturated that is that is very important so usually what we will do if it is a ferrite core and if you wanted to build an inductor for example again this uh, okay this is again relevant for us as i told for a typical inductor current there is a dc current so the dc current operate our inductor initially with the flux density b not somewhere here now this repetitive waveform will make the flux density to swing in both direction now if the swing is large if the swing is large there is a high chance you may touch the saturation the positive swing is large there is a high chance it may touch the saturation and in that case you will you will be in a you will be in a danger because you are exceeding the saturation your core is getting saturated 
so we should restrict this uh, swing without getting saturated okay now if you provide an air gap what you will do what we what we can uh, what we have an advantage without saturation i could have a large amount of current so whenever dc bias current is there whenever you have a large dc bias current or whenever you have a large dc component of the current and if you need to build an inductor it is customary to provide an air gap so that you will not your swing will not reach to the saturation because once the moment you provide an air gap you could able to uh, uh, have a larger slope and you will touch the saturation at a high value of the current so this inductors basically now this inductors which is a which is made up of uh, iron core iron powder and this insulating material basically this insulating material provide an effect of an air gap provide an effect of air gap so instead of giving a physical air gap all this material have a distributed air gap because it is made up of an insulating material mixed with the ferrite core all this powdered core all this powdered core will have a distributed air gap distributed air gap that means you don't want to provide a physical air gap when it comes to the powdered core you don't want to give a physical air gap there is a distributed air gap so since it is having a distributed air gap what inference you will get you can have a large dc bias current you can have a large dc bias current that means with a dc current also this core will not get saturated if this dc current value is limited to its maximum rating so powdered core the powder iron core are such preferred for the applications where if you have a large dc bias current bias current so if you wanted to make a boost inductor you could be wanted to make a flyback transformer if you wanted to make a high uh, gain power electronics converters when you when you are basing an inductor based switched inductor based high 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 voltage gain power electronics converters in such applications uh, you can make use of the powdered core because they have a high they have a distributed air gap since air gap is all distributed air gap in the sense insulating materials are distributed throughout the magnetic core it will not get saturate it of course it will get saturate but it will not get saturate for a considerable amount of a dc bias current so that is a, one of the advantage of uh, powdered core they have a distributed air gap but one of the disadvantages the moment you have a dist air gap the relative permeability the permeability reduces so you could see the effective permeability of a powdered iron core is very less uh, maybe a 15 to 500 that is a relative permeability whereas a relative permeability of the ferrite core for an smbc application in the range of a 2000 to 3000 so compared to this this powdered iron core having a very small uh, relative permeability that means to realize the same value of inductor the powdered iron core required more number of turns whereas ferrite core re required less number of turns because of the larger permeability but still powdered iron core can be used when the dc bias current is larger dc bias current is larger they basically available in two shape one is a toroidal shape and another is a e shape and the sendust and mbp core are commonly available in our market i mean sendust is more available sendust is uh, uh, commonly available in our local market mbp or any other high flux such cores need to be imported it is not uh, readily available in our indian market but you can have a sendust core so apart from the ferrite core when you have to operate a your inductor or a inductor with a high dc bias current the preferred magnetic core is the powdered iron core and one of the commonly available powdered iron core is such sendust is a low cost it is the price is comparable with the ferrite core but the moment you go with mbp the price will be 3 to 5 times than the sendust or ferrite 
so these are the different powdered iron core as i told these two these three cores are available on our market and if you wanted to uh, find out or if you wanted to use any of this core you need to import you need to import uh, from outside india at present there is uh, the, these three cores are not available so this cores having high sa flux density saturation flux density for example you can see the mbp core having a saturation flux, flux density of about 0.8 tesla high flux core having a saturation flux density of 1.5 tesla uh, sundust having a saturation flux density of 1 tesla whereas ferrite having a saturation flux density of uh, 0.45 tesla so all this saturation flux density is measured at 25 degrees celsius and also you could see the sundust or powdered iron core they can operate in the range of a 200 kilohertz but whereas mbp core can go up to 2 megahertz of frequency and among all these core the lowest thermal stability is for a ferrite core around 200 degrees celsius of a temperature the ferrite core become a diamagnet it loses its magnetic property whereas all other cores can be used for a high frequency high frequency high temperature applications but when it comes to the cost the cost is important right when it comes to the cost the mbp core and high flux core are costly whereas the ferrite and powdered iron core are very cheap these are very cheap and well available in the market this is costly and of course need to be imported for example uh, for example if you consider a power converter so this is a power electronics converter which we built uh, for a battery to battery charger bidirectional charger for a particular ev company in bangalore for example this is a battery and this load also replaced by a battery so to for a battery to battery charger a universal uh, dc to dc converter which is always this is an existing converter that need to be built so now this converters is a non isolated converters and which can operate usually with a low power rating less than 500 watt that is what the usual power rating of this particular converters but this particular company wanted this converter to operate a 3 kilowatt of power level which is usually very difficult difficult because if you wanted to build a 3 kilowatt of converters with a non isolated topology like this this inductor should be very large this magnetic inductor or the inductor or magnetic core which need to be selected to build this converter will be very large very large so it will be very heavy and bulky so in a general operation it's difficult why it is difficult uh, that also uh, we should understand as i told again i am drawing the very our familiar bh curve let us say this is the bh curve if you consider the boost converters buck converters flyback converters etc and if you see the inductor current if you see the inductor current flowing through these converters i as I, 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 as i told this will have a dc value plus a repetitive superimposed current this is the general structure of the current flowing through boost or buck or even a flyback converter that means it have a dc plus a superimposed ac values that means if you consider this bh curve if you consider a bh curve since there is a dc since there is a dc value initially itself you may, you may be operating somewhere here b not corresponding to the dc value then you will have a flex swing so basically flex swinging may be happening between these two extremes let us say the flex swing is happening between these two extremes so our bh curve is in first quadrant and third quadrant out of the complete bh curve or bh loop available we are only making use of a small portion of the bh curve small portion of the bh curve that is only in the first quadrant so if your converter only use make use of only one quadrant of your bh curve such converters are known to be the single ended converters single ended 
power electronics converters. So example is a boost converter is a single ended converter. Buck converter is a single ended converter. Sita, CPIC, uh, even flyback. All these converters are single ended converters because flex swing is happening. The swinging of the flex delta B is happening only in one quadrant. Now you see in the available magnetic, the magnetic utilization is very less. Magnetic utilization is very less. Now, if you're using such a single ended converters for high power, very high power, what will happen? The current drawn from the source has to be increased. That means your this DC current value has to be increased. Then, let us say the instead of using at a 500 watt, if I go for a one kilowatt, my average DC current will be double of this one, double of this one, and we will have a flux swinging here. That means instead of operating here, I may be operating somewhere here, and then I put a flux swing. What will happen? My core will saturate. If I increase the power, if I increase the power level, I need to have a higher current that is flowing through a converter. So instead of operating at the initial B naught, my B naught will be shifted to somewhere here. And a small flex swing is enough to uh, touch the saturation. So in order to avoid the saturation, what you can do, you have to use a bigger core having a very high, <laughs> very wide uh, VX curve. That is one way. So either you need to operate, you have to choose if a magnetic core of a very high size, otherwise your core will get saturated. But instead of using in one quadrant, instead of using in one quadrant, if you are make use of both quadrant, if you are make use of both quadrant, a flex swing is happening, make use of both quadrant, that means you could have a high current rating or you could have handle more power. So converters which make use of magnetic BH curve first and third quadrants, they can operate at very high power level and that such converters are known to be the double ended converters, double ended converters, ended converters. Such converters are a half bridge, half bridge is a double ended converters. Push pull is a double ended converters. Full bridge DC DC converter is a double ended converters. So that is why full bridge DC DC converters are commonly used for high power rating more than one kilowatt because you use both for the first and third quadrant. So without getting saturation, because you have more room, you can having a flex swing up to this much now. But if you are operating only one quadrant, you, you, your flex swing is limited. Now you can have a larger flex swing without touching the saturation. So you could have a much better magnetic utilization. So double ended converters are generally preferred for high power applications. High power applications. Whereas these converters are usually preferred less than 500 watt of applications, low power, low power applications. Because of the limitations, because of this uh, magnetic limitations. Now, here you see this is also a single ended converters. This also is single ended converters. So I have to utilize this area of your flex, I mean, BH curve. But uh, the particular company wanted to build a three kilowatt. So building a three kilowatt with a normal ferret core, even with air gap, either the core size will be should be very heavy. So the converter size and weight will increase. That is not acceptable. So only one way to go for uh, instead of using a ferret core, go for some other core whose flex density is more than one Tesla. So that resulted into uh, going for this, uh, what you can say, high flux core whose saturation flux density is 1.6 Tesla, but it can operate around a 500 kilohertz of frequency. So that is what we done. We went for a high flux core. You see, it's a high flux core having a saturation flux density of 1.6 Tesla. It's a comparatively uh, smaller core compared to a WE55. The so shape is almost equal to slightly larger than WE55 core, but it is made up of 
distributed air gap, it having a distributed air gap. You don't want to give an external air gap. So such cores are being brought. Now, once you have a core, you need to wound this uh, uh, copper wires on the core. So usually we don't wound on the core. We don't wound on the core because the copper wire consisting of, a, I mean, has to carry the current. When the current is flowing, it basically heating up this core. So the core temperature increases. So as I told, as the temperature increases, the flux density reduces. So we want a fl stable flux density. So what you will do, instead of mounting, winding on the core, we will use some kind of a uh, magnetic formers. We will what we will do, we will put some kind of a insulating former or bobbin. Bobbin or former we will keep. So on top of this bobbin or former, we will wound. So that is what you can see. A former or bobbin will be looks like this. A former or bobbin is usually generally looks like this. So on top of this bobbin, we will be winding. And finally, this will be kept in the middle limb. So you could see on the top of the former, we wound these wires. The number of turns we could find out by using a simple equations. We will see that. And once you wound, uh, this former will be connected to this uh, middle limb and your final core is made. See, if, if, I, if you are making this particular converter with a ferrate core, then the core size will be very large. Sometimes you cannot realizable, but due to the availability of uh, modern magnetic cores, enable us to use a smaller size core. You could see uh, the length is around 6.5 centimeters. Uh, and uh, the converter, you could see, it's a, it can handle a power of a 3 kilowatt, which is uh, very small in shape. You can see, you can, you can see, this is not a bigger converter. So it is a handy, can handle a three kilowatt of power, and it is a non-isolated. And this core is basically a high flux core, having a flux density of 1.6 Tesla. So apart from Farad core, that's my point is, apart from Farad core, you could have a, all these magnetic cores available in the market, except, except, except especially these two are readily available. Other core you may require to import. You may require to import. So some of you might be working in a working with a dual active bridge converters, the DAB converters, and power electronics converters for a solid state transformers, etc. In that case, you may require a a high power uh, handling core who can operate around 100 to 200 kilohertz of frequency. In that kind of uh, applications, instead of ferrate, you can also go with the amorphous core. Amorphous core. Amorphous core. It having a glass kind of a structure and is having a saturation flux density of 1.5 Tesla. So such cores are also amor uh, available. Amorphous core also available in India. Uh, only one vendor, I think Hitachi or something, is only one vendor where you could get the amorphous core. Uh, if you wanted to go for X flux and high flux, so you have to order from abroad. But all other cores are available in India. Now let us see. Uh, once you have this uh, magnetic core, or what are the uh, general consideration to build an inductor. Let us see, I'm having a double E core like this. As I told, two double E core forms a complete magnetic path. A complete magnetic path. Two double E forms form a complete magnetic path. So you have a three limbs. This is the middle limb. This is the middle limb. So if you see the E core, usually the manufacturer will give E core with a, some kind of a nomenclature like this. For example, E42, E4221, some number here. 
So E42 means this length is a 42 millimeter. 21 means this length is a 21 millimeter. And C means this length. It is a three, two dimension, right? So this width is a C. So this is a A, B, C. This is how a generally the E core uh, E core is available. For example, if you see WE42 core uh, from a TDK, you could see E42 2120 is the number. So you could see the length of the core is a 42. Uh, this length is a 21, and this this length. I mean, basically, this is a two dimension. This width is a 20. So usually. In general, uh, this uh, let us say this is the core area A, then area of this limb will be A by 2, this limb will be A by 2 in general. It is always not true, but in most of the case, if the middle limb is having an area A, so remaining two limbs area will be half of that, half of that. So two such magnetic core will form a complete magnetic structure, a closed structure, like this. Close structure like this. So without air gap, without air gap, if you uh, attach these two magnetic core, you will get a closed structure like this. So usually in the middle of this limb, this middle, this, this is the middle limb, without air gap, if I attach it, I will mount my inductors or wires on this middle of this limb. So what I will do, I will connect a bobbin as I shown previously. Uh, a bobbin will be mounted on this. So instead of directly mounting the inductors, I mean, instead of directly mounting on the core, I will be winding on a bobbin. So on top of this bobbin, I will be putting my windings. I will be putting my windings. So this area is known to be the window area available for winding so you are you are you are basically your once you wound uh, this area is available for winding this area is available for winding so this is known to be the window area and this area cross section of your middle limb is known to be the uh, area of the core area of the core so basically you have to be careful i mean we have to note down two areas one is the available area for winding the wire and what is the available area of the core? Usually the middle limb area of cross section. If you measure this area of cross section, remember that will be half of the middle limb. So usually we will take the middle limb as the reference. So AC is the area of cross section of the middle limb. And AW is the available area. So the complete area is not available for winding. Why? The complete area is not available to host the wires because most of the transformers and inductors are naturally cooled. We don't put a fan on an inductor. We don't put a, a fan on a transformer, right? So it is supposed to be naturally cooled. So what we will do, once you wound, let us say if one layer of the conductors are wound, Before winding the next layer on top of it, we will put some insulating materials. We will be putting some insulating materials. Materials, usually a paper insulator. Usually a paper insulator. And if you don't have a paper insulator, don't worry. Go to the nearest medical shop and find out a medical tape, paper medical tape. Medical tape is enough to build a laboratory uh, based inductor, medical tape, paper based medical tapes are available. So that can be served as this insulating material. And on top of this, you can wind secondary winding or if you are building an inductor, the remaining uh, wires that can be wound. And again, you will put your insulating materials. Again, you will put your insulating materials and you will keep always an air gap so that 
when this when the current is flowing through the conductors it obviously produce some heat and the heat naturally need to be dissipated because you cannot give a force to cooling inductors or something usually not not a practice in a power converters we have a cooling system for the complete converters we don't have a cooling system only for the transformers or an inductors since these are very closed structure we generally provide a, dis a air gap or some free space so that the heat can dissipate it freely so out of all this available window i may not be able to operate the complete area i cannot able to operate the complete area to host the wires i will be taking a small fraction of this a small fraction of this and that fraction is known to be the window utilization factor window utilization factor which is in the range of a 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 0 0.3 to 0.5 for example if you are using a round conductors if you are using a round conductors to wind your inductor wind your inductors the window utilization factor will be on the in 0.3 to 0.4 it is in the range of 0.3 to 0.35 what do you mean by 0.3 out of all available area one by third of the area is only used for winding remaining two by third of area has to be kept for insulations creep page and also providing the uh, what you can see uh, air i mean clearance so you can utilize only 30 percentage or 33 percentage of the total window area for uh, winding the uh, or hosting the wires that is the meaning of a kw if it is 0 0.5 means out of the available area 50 percentage you could use for uh, hosting the wires remaining 50 percentage can be utilized for putting the creep pages uh, insulation insulations and also to provide the uh, some of the air gap so if it is a sometime with the high current uh, inductors are there instead of a round conductors you will be using uh, this kind of a square structures uh, a kind of this kind of a wires in that case you could accommodate more number of windings so in that case the kw value is around 0 0.4 to 0.5 more than 40 percentage you could use for winding in general, we use round conductors, right? In most of our mar market, you used to get a copper wires, which are round conductors. So usually we will take a 0.3 to 0.35. So now you have two areas. One is a, a area of your middle limb, that is the area of cross section, and also the area of your window. So these two areas plays an important role for selecting the inductor. Now, if you are designing an inductor, there is two quite a standard methods to select the inductor, I mean, core. One is uh, go with an area product method. Another is go with a core geometrical constant method, KG method. At the end, both methods will give you more or less similar results. So core geometrical method seems to be more accurate, better, much better than the area product method. But area product method is very simple and a straightforward procedure. So it is up to you, up to you, up to you to decide which method you should use. At the end, there will not be much difference in the selection of the core. So when it comes to the area product method, as you know, as, you, as I told, there will be two areas that uh, we need to consider. One is the area of the middle limb and the area of your uh, window area. So this area of the core, area of the window area, AW, the multiplication of this two area is known to be the area product AP, area product AP. So AP is given by the inductance value which you need to be built and the maximum value of the current flowing through the conductors or flowing through the inductor and the RMS value of the current flowing through the inductor divided by KW. KW is window utilization factor for a round conductor it is 0.3 to 0.35. For a foil conductor, this is known to be a foil conductor. Okay, foil conductors it can be larger value, KW, J and B max, where the J is the current density. If you are using a naturally cooling current, naturally cooling method, there is no force cooling in your converter. You you don't put any fan. 
in that case you can have a current density of 3 ampere per mm square or 3 into 10 to the power of 6 ampere per meter square this much current you can have a per meter square or per mm square of your conductor if you are going for a natural cooling natural cooling with a round conductor natural cooling with copper conductor, with copper conductor. But if you go for a force cooling, you can increase this current density up to 5 to the power of 10 to the power of 6 ampere per meter square or 5 ampere per mm square. If you are using a forced cooling, with some kind of a fan or something is attached to your converter to dissipate the heat, then you can have a large current density. So, Based on these two factors, you could find out if you know what is the value of inductance to be built, and if you know the what is the peak value of the current flowing through the inductor, and the RMS value of the current flowing through the inductor, and then based on these factors, you can if you are using a round copper conductor, if the KW is in the range of a 0.3, and if you use a parade core, as I told, we will keep the flex, maximum flux density as 0.2 Tesla or up to 0.3 Tesla, even though the data sheets say it is 0.49 or 0.5. This is at 25 degrees Celsius. So considering the thermal effect, we will be fixing uh, the flux density much smaller. And as I said, J is around 3 ampere per mm square, if it is a natural cooling. Then you could find out AC and AW. Once you find out AC and AW, we should find out the appropriate core. To find out the appropriate core, we will have a magnetic core tables like this. Any power electronics textbooks will have a magnetic core tables. So in magnetic core tables, one of the uh, entry is a area product. You can see AP. AP is nothing but the multiplication of the window area and cross area. So from this, you will find out what is the area product required. And based on that, the area product you will find out the core which having an area product which is equal or larger than the calculated value usually we will go for the larger than the calculated value and you will select that particular core let us say if i select a core of p40 to 29 with an area product of 4.768 then for this particular code i could find out what is the actual core cross-sectional area that is 2.64 and actual window area 1.81. So these two values I will note down. So when I have once I having the actual value of the core cross section by selecting the proper core by knowing this area product, what I will do, I will find out the number of turns required to build that particular value of the inductance. So the number of turns depends upon the inductor value, the peak value of the current, again the flux density, and the AC. What is this AC? Uh, area product for the selected core. We might have selected this core from our example. I have selected this core. So this ha core having an area product of 2.64. How I reach it to this core? Because I find out the area product. And the area product, let us say area product is 3. 3, uh, 3 into 10 to the power of 4 mm raised to 4. So I will take a core whose area product is larger than that. So from my core table, if my area product happened to be 3 into 10 to the power of 4, there is only one core which having area product immediately larger than that. That is 4.7 4 into 10 to the power of 4. So I select this core and then note down the actual core cross-sectional area. So once I know the actual core cross-sectional area, I could find out the number of turns. Once I know the number of turns, if you are making an inductor, as I, know, as I told, we should provide an air gap in order to avoid the saturation. I could find out what is the required air gap. What is the required air gap? Now, once you have this air gap, how you fix this air gap or how you make this air gap practically? So for example, if you are using a 2E core, you are using a 2E core to build one inductor, one inductor. And let us say you got this A, as a 3 millimeter as a air gap. So we have a 3 limb. So 3 millimeter divided by 3. So we will provide 1 millimeter of air gap between the core. 
so generally what we will do there is two way to produce this you can have a screw structures screw kind of arrangement where you can lift one of the core above with the 1 mm gap that is one method another method is if you don't have such an arrangement another method which widely used in the lab is fill with i mean you will provide some kind of an insulating material here usually a paper insulator is fine we will keep a 1 mm thickness paper insulator paper insulator so we will this this basically a three dimension right basically a three dimension each each thing is a three dimension so exactly at the shape of i mean the size of that uh, limb you will cut the paper insulator and keep it in between so of course the permeability has changed if it is an air gap the permeability is 4 4 pi to 10 to the power of minus 7 now instead of a permeability if you put a paper insulator uh, it's not the air gap permeability permeability has changed so the inductor value also changes a little bit so you required a, a trial and error or kind of a, a quite uh, adjustment to reach uh, the previously got the inductor values so this is how usually built an inductor uh, in our laboratory i'm not going to uh, many other aspects has to be considered i'm not going into that details as of now so once you build the inductors you have to find out what should be the size of the wire which need to be wound on this inductor so if you know the rms value of the current that you might have already knowing and if you know the current density current density as i told if it is a uh, natural cooling 3 ampere per mm square will be the current density you can take it for around conductors then you could you could find out the cross sectional area of a wire so this aw is basically the wire gauge now there is a two kind of wire gauge tables are available or two kind of standard wires are available in our market one is swg that is standard wire gauge and another is american wire gauge awg if you are in a north like north america the wires are available in awg if you are in a commonwealth countries the countries uh, ruled by uk or i mean great britain so such countries are used swg so in india the wires are available in a standard wire gauge standard wire gauge there is no much difference between awg and swg the slight conversion factors are there so usually our wire tables are available in swg so you could find out you could see the wire tables like this for example this wire is swg 45 having a area of this much for example swg 23 having a area of 0.29 mm square that is the wire gauge or conductor area uh, swg 15 having a area of 2.6 mm square you remember swg 42 for example you will have a wire of swg 42 and if you have a wire of swg 10 this wire will be very thin the area will be very less swg 10 will be larger as the swg value reduces the thickness or the size of the wire increases so swg 10 means uh, can carry a current of 20 to 30 amperes whereas swg 42 can be carry a current of a 3 ampere or 2 amperes so that you that you that that you can remember so based on this aw value uh, this is what is the aw value find out uh, a wire which is having larger aw for example if your calculated value is 0.2 then you could use swg 24 because it have a area 0.24 mm square so much larger than 0.2 or slightly larger than 0.2 you can use a wire of swg 24 sometime if you are operate if you are building a converter of a very high current rating and our standard swg wires are not available then multiple wires can be connector in parallel and make use of for building this converters
Now, uh, most of the cases, this conductors has to be carry a current of something like this, a repetitive mag magnitude currents at high frequencies. The frequency may be about a 50 kilohertz or maybe a 100 kilohertz or maybe much more than that. If it is a quite a DC current, if it is a, a simple DC current, the current will be distributed throughout this uh, conductor uniformly without any problem. But when you have an AC current of high frequency, as you know, there is a there is an effect called skin effect. So what will happen? The current try to flow only through the up, only through the small portion of this conductor, and remaining portions the current is not flowing because of this uh, inductance effect. You may be knowing the reason for skin effect. So due to the magnetic field, the current try to concentrate or will flow only through the small portion or upper upper shield of your uh, wire. So the whole uh, region of this uh, or whole area of the diameter of the, what you can say, the whole conductor is not used. Only a small portion of the area is got used. So when you are using only a small, small, a small portion, you could see the resistance will increase. Resistance will increase. So the AC resistance or the resistance offered by a high frequency repetitive waveform will be much, much larger than the DC resistance. Since the resistance increases, you will have a large I square, I square losses. So this distance or this width is known to be the skin depth. We call it as a skin depth. Depth, the, the small area or the small portion of your conductor through which the current is flowing is known to be, for example, if it is a, I'm sorry for my drawing, let us consider a round conductors. And at a high frequency, if the current is concentrating only in this small upper region and other uh, available regions are not able to conduct the current. So this distance is known to be the skin depth delta. We call it as a skin depth, skin depth. Usually for a copper conductor, skin depth is given by 72 by root F. If it is a copper conductor, F is the frequency of operation. Or other case, it will be pi, mu, sigma, and F. That is the skin depth. If you wanted to find out where this is the conductivity, mu is the permeability, pi is uh, pi itself, and F is the frequency of operation. For a copper conductor, once you substitute the conductivities and everything, you will finally end up in this symbol equation. So, for example, your conductor is you are operating at a hundred kilohertz, hundred kilohertz, and you find out the skin depth as 0.1 mm square or mm. You find out a skin depth as a 0.1 mm. Now, what you will do to avoid the skin depth? Let us say this diameter of the conductor is 5 mm, and uh, the skin depth is uh, happen to be 0.1 mm. So instead of using a one conductor of 5 mm diameter, you will be using multiple conductors of diameter 1 mm. You will be using multiple conductors of diameter 1 mm, and that will be connected in parallel. So if you wanted to have a 5 amperes of current, and you will be using n numbers of such 0.1 mm diameter wires, instead of using a 5 mm wires, and this whole 5 amperes will be equally divided and flow through all these wires, small wires. And these wires are not parallelly connected. Instead, it will be connected transpose. We will be using transpose. So the stray inductance will be reduced transpose. So such wires are known to be the radio wires, radio wires or Litz wires, Litz wires. And you could see uh, a Litz wire, which is available in the market. It looks like this. For example, this is a Litz wire. You can, you can see a large number of strands, large number of strands, thin strands, are transposed and connected in parallel. Transposed and connected in parallel. And all these wires, for example, if you have a 500 wires, all these wires, wires are insulated each other. They are not uh, conduct, conducting together. I mean, they will conduct together, but they are insulated each other. And finally, the complete package is wrapped on a 
nylon cloth, nylon wrap, nylon wrap that you can see here. And this nylon wrap you can remove and get it. For example, uh, okay. Now, uh, 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 when you are building, uh, when you are using this leads wire to build an inductor or to mount an inductor, it is our job to remove this insulation from all these wires. For example, if you have a 500 small strands, you need to remove the insulation from the all 500 st strands. There are two methods. One is you can use some chemicals. Once you sing it on the chemical, I don't remember exactly the name of the chemical. And if you sing it for a one or two hours, this uh, insulation will be peeled out. Another thing is instead of using a chemical, if you have a good soldering ion and who can operate around 300 degrees Celsius to 350 degrees Celsius. And if you heat it up and soldered, all this uh, uh, insulation also go out. That is what you can see once you soldered together. This end, it will act as a single conductor and uh, all the current will be entering and divided equally and flow through the parallel conductors inside. And if you are not using a, a leads wire and only using a copper wire, you could see there's a single copper wire. Such wires are used for low frequency application. When it comes to the high frequency application, uh, in order to avoid the uh, heat uh, skin effect, it is better to use um, leads wires. Uh, in market, for example, if you go to the market and uh, purchasing a leads wire, it may be marked as 42 bar 200 or it may be marked as a 44 bar 500. So what does it mean, 42 bar 500? 42 means SWG, SWG. So 200 beats numbers. So 200 wires of 200 wires are connected in parallel and each wire having a SWG of 42. 200 stands of SWG 42 wires are connected in parallel. 44 bar 500 means you have a 500 stands connected in parallel, which is transposed, and each wire having a size of 44 SWG. So that is how the leads wires are available. So when you go to the market and purchasing a leads wire, you should know what is the rating. And there will be tables, equivalent SWG, equivalent SWG of this. For example, if you have 200 wires of 42 SWG connected in parallel, the net conductor size is not 42, right? It's not 42. So there will be an equivalent SWG value that uh, that will be available with the manufacturer's uh, uh, data sheets and you can find out what is the equivalent SWG, then you could use that wire. Uh, another important thing, this is what I top told the medical tapes which you may use for providing the insulations. For example, this is the bobbin. This is the bobbin I need to fix. And here I'm building a transformer. I will have a primary winding and a secondary winding. What I done on the bobbin, I mark the primary winding. Then I provide insulations. Here this is the insulations. And the insulations is basically provided by the paper insulators in most of our high frequency converters. At low power, the paper insulators are a very cost effective solution. And once you provide the insulation, then you can provide your secondary winding. Oh, this is very simple winding technique. If you wanted to reduce the leakage inductance, you have to have a interleaved winding, primary and secondary together. Here itself, secondary will come the, along with the primary. But I'm not going for an interleaving. I'm just providing a simple winding structure. So on the bobbin, I first wound the primary, then I will provide the insulation by using this insulating tape, and then I wound the secondary winding. Then again, I will wrap with the uh, paper insulation. Uh, remember, this is not the normal insulating tape which we are using for our wiring. These are the paper insulators. If you don't get a paper insulator, go to the medical store and get the medical tape, which also made up of a papers. So, once you wound everything, you could see I am using another kind of a tape to uh, wound this or make the yellow tape to make this uh, uh, attach it together. And this is also a kind of insulator and they are polyamide material, polyamide material. 
usually made up of a known to be captain captain type captain type compared to the normal insulators they have a very high temperature uh, resistivity uh, and it will it have a very good temperature stability especially when you are making an inductors or transformers to carry a very high amount of current so in that case you can avoid paper insulator and you could use this captain type because its thermal stability is very high and also it's a thermal it will dissipate the heat much faster rate so these are the references which i followed and uh, i will try to show uh, I will try to show a, a kind of a fully made inductor. This is a, an inductor which is made in the lab. I hope it is visible. You could see. Yes, yes, uh, it's visible. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the lead wire which is uh, connected together. And uh, in fact, these are the two E cores. For example, this is one E core and this is another E core. As I told, this complete E core will form a one single magnetic path. And if you wanted to provide air gap, either you could have a screw arrangement which provide the specified air gap between the core, or you could put uh, insulating papers in between and then put together. Now, your, your windings are made on the bobbins. So each magnetic core have different shape and different size. Accordingly, there will be winding. So you could purchase Litz wires, which is available in our local market. So as I told, Litz wires, this is Litz wires. Uh, uh, the number is given is a 200 divided by 42. 200 divided by 42 means there is a 42 AWG wires are used at, and 200 such numbers are there. So such Litz wires are there. Uh, you can use this Litz wire to wound your bobbin. For example, like this manually we used to wound. And you can count the number of turns. So once everything is wounded, what you will do, you can attach the bobbin back to your core. And then you can measure the inductance. So how we measure the inductance? Uh, we will have a, a LCR meters. So when you are using the LCR meters, you should, for example, if you made an inductor for a 100 kilohertz, then if you, your LCR meter cannot measure up to 100 kilohertz, it can only measure up to 1 kilohertz. Remember, the inductance value it's shown will be different from the actual inductance value. So if you make an inductor of a 100 kilohertz, it is always better to measure the inductance at the rated frequency. But in the worst case, if you don't have an LCR meter for that much frequency, kindly uh, use those uh, LCR meter at the maximum possible frequency, but be sure that the actually measured inductance will be slightly vary because as the frequency varies, the actual inductance value also varies. I think I will be stopping here. If you have any doubt, I am glad to uh, I mean, glad to discuss. Otherwise, we could wind up. Yeah, uh, participants, your mics are uh, now. You can open and on. You can unmute and ask question directly to the expert. Okay, I think there is no. Yeah, thank you, uh, Celes. Uh, it okay. was a very wonderful session. Again, it is a press for me because I was attending completely here. Okay, thank you. I know you are very busy still. You could not deny me. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Sau, sir. Uh, and uh, thank you yeah. for giving an opportunity. Okay. Yeah, I think so if you have uh, any. 
any uh, attendee have any questions i think he can directly email to you uh, okay. if uh, okay thank, thank you. you thank you zeles so i'm leaving okay yeah